Our next guest is Frank Holmes, a guest everyone's familiar with on our show. He's been calling for gold prices to hit all-time highs for basically ever, and it's come true finally. No one's probably happier than you, Frank, right? I'm very, very happy, and uh, I think there's so much enthusiasm now for gold. We're due for a correction, and that would be great. Buy on the dips. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. A lot of people I've talked to say that um, a major correction um, is not going to happen anymore. So when you say correction, what, what kind of a magnitude are we talking about? In every time you have a secular bull market, there are, there are many 10% corrections, uh, and it's just big capitulation. So you can easily get a 10% correction in stocks if you get a 3% correction in bullion. Uh, and it's just recognizing that ratio of three to one is important. And do you have the stomach to weather it? Uh, and that's all, I've always seen that. And you know, David, it was uh, Cambridge uh, and uh, 18 months ago in January where the Golden Cross just took place. And I commented on that. And it's interesting because most people are still so bearish uh, in that run. And, and only this past four weeks have I seen so many different brokerage firms in New York all of a sudden explaining about gold. I listened to one this morning by a macro shop and it's still negative. Like, okay. you know, so I, I really think that um, uh, gold is going to maintain this beautiful secular bull market. Uh, where do you think the next level is for you? What's the next key, key level that we need to take out? Uh, I, I really don't think that way, David. Uh, I think that, you know, I've, I've got a forecast. Um, a rational reason over the next couple of years, it can go to $4,000. If yeah. it goes higher, it'll be because of economic forces. But I believe there's a huge gap, like Ray Dalio says, there is a gap of inequality on income between the wealthiest and the poorest. But there's also a huge gap politically on the solutions to, for that problem. Right. And therefore, if there's a huge gap of, of philosophy with politic, politicians, then that means we're going to have a big gap between fiscal monetary policies. Mm -hmm. That has historically always been bullish for gold. And we have seen this since 2000. I mean, if you look back over the past 20 and a half years of this new century, gold, in, on looking at those 20 years, has been up 80% of the time. But most people are so quick to be bearish on it. Gold has outperformed the S&P 500 almost three to one. Yeah. So gold as an asset class and a portfolio and a reason not to have it is actually foolish. And so I think that we're going to see on this cycle a greater adoption of gold as an important asset class rebalance once a quarter, once a year, but it should be in your portfolio. Frank, you wrote last week an excellent report that I encourage everybody to read. Um, that there's more money in the system today than ever before. And I wonder if this is because, uh, as you just brought up, if this has any political implications as well. I mean, isn't it easier for politicians to finance uh, their political agenda by just printing money than to raise taxes on people? Well, only to a certain degree, but I think the more important part of that equation is the G20. So if they function like a cartel, like an oil cartel, yeah, and and therefore one's not going to hurt hurt the other, and they all print equally, and they all print as a percentage. Then no one currency is going to be out of whack with the other, and it sort of masquerades. But that's the secular bull market in gold because gold will then rocket against all currencies. Okay, I want to just go back to your uh, four thousand dollar call, which you made. Uh, you first told me about last month, and um, you know, excellent analysis. Basically, you told me that. Uh, Last time we had monetary expansion or expansion of the Fed balance sheet back in 08, 09, we saw gold rise in tandem between 2009 to 2011. Gold prices rose 200%. And if you applied the same growth metric to today, we can see gold go to $4,000. If I'm wondering if uh, the Fed balance sheet expands even faster than you anticipated today, would you see gold go up even higher than $4,000? Is that possible? You know, it could. And, and for me, my forecasts are not just that's one simple way of looking at it. But I think the more important is look at Greenspan. He was always criticized. And when Greenspan left, uh, the Fed's balance sheet was 6% of GDP. And now it's over 30%. Uh, and there's no complaining. 
to the degree, except for people that look at macroeconomics and gold. Uh, but the general thought process in Wall Street still is not there. So I think that gold can probably go higher because they can't even fathom still 4,000 like they could fathom 1,900. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what we're seeing is very different is that governments like Switzerland or Japan float a bond. No one buys it because it's got zero interest rate. And they turn around and create funny money and they go and buy stocks or they buy their ETF. And what we're seeing the Federal Reserve do is come in to get corporate bond yields down. They're buying, they cannot go and buy them directly, so they're buying it through an ETF. And they're buying munis through an ETF to get those yields down to keep the economy inexpensively rolling over. That's yeah. unprecedented. So that's the real bullish statement that could project your gold prices much higher. Frank, where do you see inflation headed in the next 12 to 18 months? Uh, are you going to see inflation or deflation? Well, I think you're going to see inflation and it's going to be a gradual increase, but I don't think see rates are going to rise as quickly as you're going to see inflation. So what does that mean? It means you're going to get negative real interest rates. And the greater the negative real interest rates, the greater the move in the price of gold. So if we mm -hmm. go back to 2011, when gold hit 1900 the last time, yeah. the 10-year government bond was a minus 300 basis points. And, then infl and so then inflation fell uh, and allowed, therefore, a positive rate of return and gold fell. Now we see in this past year is that real interest rates are basically going back to zero. And I think you're going to see them go negative. And when they're negative 300 basis points, this cycle, gold goes to 4,000. So uh, here's this chart that I want to show the viewers that you uh, brought up with me as well. Velocity of money. And as you can see, the long-term trend of the um, velocity of M2 supply has been trending down. In recent, in, you know, recent times, it's been basically at all-time lows, according to this chart. As the money velocity decreases, what we're seeing is people have been spending less money and economic recovery where economic activity is stagnating. And under these conditions, how can you expect prices to inflate if no one's spending any money? Well, you just can't use money velocity now as an indicator of inflation. That's really an important, right. important factor. I think more important is to remember, since when 1980, when gold went through 850 and silver 50, and the ratio back then was 17 to 1 to gold to silver, um, you had very high interest rates. And, and it's really important to put that in this context of what we have today. Uh, and so I, I think uh, this multiplying effect back then, the difference is CPI algorithm. The calculations for creating CPI when gold hit 850 has changed many times. And so if you use that old CPI algorithm today, mm -hmm. they say we have inflation of 6%. Nine months ago, it was 9%. So I think as, as, as inflation goes back with the old model, that we're going to see inflation run at a higher rate, which I relate to that inflation better. Uh, and, but I don't think rates are going to real, the rates are, the bank's going to pay you is not going to rise as quickly. Have you been seeing any evidence of inflation in just your personal life as you go out and look at things? Have things gone up in price? Housing. Housing, look at Toronto, and I, I don't know about Montreal, yeah. but uh, I'm told the condos in New York haven't, but I find that difficult uh, in a scheme because in San Antonio, uh, housing sales are up 17% month over month. How is, that, how is that possible during the coronavirus pandemic, Frank? Well, another stock I'm going to tell you to add to that is Home Depot. So I've been going to Home Depot during the lockdown, and it's packed. So everyone's stuck at home, and what are they doing? They're refurbishing and renovating their homes. So there's a company that's really benefiting from that, and the workers have been allowed to continue to work as long as they have masks on renovations. Yeah. Uh, and so what's happening, people are saying, I don't like my house. I'm going to go get a new one. And, and so they can now do it through video. They can turn around and scout it out if they want to go physically see it. So many times these homes are being bought just by video watching. Yeah. Well, it's very much a paradigm shift. Wow. But I think it also, also country estates, getting out of the city, a lot of people, those properties have been going up because mortgages are cheap. You, you know, you expect that uh, uh, sales activity for housing would go down at a time when a lot of people are being laid off and are probably, you know, putting off their big pit ticket purchases. Does this surprise you at all, Frank? Yes, it does. 
And and same with boats. Well, I was watching a report yesterday that boat sales are up because a lot of people want to get on yachts or boats to get away from city centers uh, until this coronavirus settles down. So it's really, to me, a lot of contrarian things. Winnebago, I mean, those big buses you basically drive, their, their sales have been on a tear. Yeah. Um, and, and look at my Jets ETF. Uh, I mean, it, it was for 70 days of a billion dollars came into it. And all those Robin Hood investors all of a sudden buying at the bottom before it had its first big surge. It corrects and gets ready for the next surge. Uh, and when that'll happen, I don't know. But there's a lot of country interesting things when rates fall to zero and the government starts all of a sudden playing a role in the capital markets through ETFs, et cetera, uh, because banks won't lend out the money. Uh, all of a sudden, they're, they're playing a role in it. It changes everything. And one thing that's always consistent is gold doesn't change and gold silver doesn't change. They become right. valuable during this scenario. Um, an interest, another interesting tip that you brought up to me was uh, coin shortages. So the U.S. Mint, uh, you wrote, has asked people to uh, put the coins back into circulation just because it's a shortage. I find that I find that fascinating. Tell us more about that story. Well, there's also if you want to take the other level, is digital money. There's a big push for digital money. Uh, and, and I think that, that, that many governments around the world are exploring that, the idea of the success of Bitcoin and Ethereum. Now, do they come up with that? Uh, and I think that we're going to continue to see shortages as a move away from paper money and as a move away that physical gold coins and, and silver coins in particular uh, are going to become more and more valuable. And so I, I think that uh, uh, on, the, on the corrections, you buy some physical silver coins is a smart idea. Frank, how much of this physical shortage is due to excessive demand or poor inventory management from the suppliers? It's a great question because I was just mentioning that um, uh, UPS and we see FedEx pilots uh, with a breakout again in Hong Kong, they don't want to fly there. They want to have the right to not to fly. Yeah. Uh, that type of disruption is very important for people to recognize because of our airlines, ETF, jets. We follow all these places. And you know, at the bottom of this cycle in, in April, the busiest airport in the world was Anchorage. Anchorage. Wow. And, and all the medical supplies are going through Anchorage to go to Europe and come to North America because Delta, America, no, no one was flying. Air Canada wasn't flying. So a goal, the movement of gold, if you want to move gold from London to New York, all of a sudden you had to fly privately. That cost them from $30,000 to $300,000. It immediately showed up on an ounce of gold, $135 premium. So the, it's very fragile, the supply lines with this just in the inventory management that model. So I think it's about not just inventory management, people don't want to type a lot of capital with any inventory and manufacture just when the demand is there. And if you break up that supply cycle, you get these huge surges. And look at Chile, it stops as copper as a strike, immediately copper takes off on the upside. Okay. Why do you think, you know, just on the demand side, why do you think people are still chasing physical uh, products right now when uh, Gold is at all-time highs. Silver has gone up 100% since its March lows. Are, are people still chasing prices higher? I don't know if they're chasing. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't feel that. Like, I don't feel the, there's the panic uh, chasing. Uh, I think people are, are waking up. I like the data point I just shared with you. Not only has gold outperformed year-to-date, uh, the S&P 500, it's outperformed for 20 years. So yeah. gold's a very relevant asset class. The gold-silver ratio has also fallen dramatically in the last couple of weeks. How are you reading that chart? Well, you know, David, I, I think what's happening is that this industry, which you're a spokesperson for, is getting respect as an important asset class. And, and I think that all of a sudden, silver ratio was crazy at 120. I think is where it hit at one time. Yeah. It's long -term, I think it's long-term median is just under 50, more like 40. Uh, if you go back to the crisis, the Iranian crisis in 1980, uh, when gold hit 850 uh, and silver hit 50, that ratio was 17. So going from 100 down to uh, 80 or 65, I don't think that that's really significant. I think it's we could see it back to 40. And that's why when gold goes to 4,000, that could easily say, why not silver at 100? Yeah. Uh, last question I have for you, Frank. As we're seeing geopolitical risks rise around the world, as we're seeing the economy still lagging in most parts of the world, you know, a lot of people are saying that safe haven assets are very important. Ray Dalio, for example, just recently said that uh, cash is trash. I don't know why he would not consider cash as a safe haven asset, 
But uh, what do you think? Where would you park your 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 money if if it were not if it were not for cash? You've already talked about gold. Where else would you put it? Well, what Dave, Ray Dalio is also saying is that cash is not safe because of real interest rates, and you're losing two percent as a tax on your capital. Right. We don't realize that. Uh, and, and he's also saying that don't be fooled because it's not volatile. It is not safe, even though it's not volatile, because most quant models say vol volatility is what makes an asset risky. And he's saying the opposite. Uh, so I think that's a, an interesting perspective to look at cash. Uh, I think dividend paying stocks uh, and, and like the Franco Nevadas or, or the Wheaton uh, Precious, uh, these are stocks that increase their dividend. Uh, they're like SaaS models, uh, like uh, uh, Microsoft, because they have high gross margins. They have recurring revenue every month. And as the price of gold and silver goes higher and their cash flows are higher, they're paying out bigger dividends. So I think stocks like that uh, are, are a better place to have your assets. And now we're seeing many of the gold mining companies coming out with this word free cash flow yield. Yeah. Very important for the generalists. They will not buy a gold stock that doesn't have free cash flow yield. Maybe a gold fund manager will, but the generals won't. He'll buy that gold stock which has a free cash flow yield. So we're hearing Yamana talk about it. Yamana getting listed in London, talking about this free cash flow yield, and they'll pay dividends or rise them. So we do see a big shift in gold mining companies, uh, and they're going to attract a bigger audience. So I think that that's very bullish for the gold stocks. I, I, just one final point, actually. Um, we've seen silver bully and outperform gold this year, but silver miners and gold miners have performed relatively similar to each other. The SIL, the silver ETF, has um, last I checked two days ago, was uh, was up 50% year to date. The uh, GDX, the Vanek Gold Miners ETF, is up 48%. So, uh, you know, why, why the similarity in performance of the gold miners and silver miners when the underlying bullions have been you know, so different in their performances. Don't, don't confuse a short-term swing trade. Okay. I, I, if you go at the beginning of the year, what was the silver-gold ratio? And then it didn't really change until three weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the, don't confuse that, that data point. I, I think more important is to look at a longer-term line and for mean reversion. And the mean reversion of the silver-gold ratio in a bull cycle, it's going back to 40. So therefore, silver is going to give you more upside to gold rising. But at the same time, everyone has to recognize the DNA of volatility of silver is 50% greater than gold. And same with the stocks. So if you're going to play silver stocks, you're going to play silver, you have to have the stomach for the volatility. Excellent thoughts as always, Frank. I uh, look forward to the next time we speak in your next update. Hi-ho, silver. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for watching Kiko News. We'll have much more for you. Stay tuned.